Okay, so this is actually a nigun that um, came to me on uh, Friday. I was playing my dulcimer and uh, this nigun came to me. So you're the first ones really hearing this, except my wife and son heard it. <laughs> everyone. We are doing Growing Through Exodus, the book of Shemot. We began the book of Shemot this week, and we're in the second parsha, the era. And there is a method that is used by Rashi, the Gemara, and many, many commentaries is connecting the beginning of a parsha to the end of the previous Parsha. This is done very often. It's called juxtaposition. And many times it's done uh, between mitzvot. We have two mitzvot, and it's not clear what the connection is. Sometimes they seem like completely different subjects altogether. And the Talmud or Rashi will come and say, this mitzvah is juxtaposed to this mitzvah to teach us the following. So the beginning of this Parsha is directly following the end of last Parsha. The end of last Parsha, after God appears to Moshe at the burning bush, convinces him to take on the mantle of leadership. So Moshe goes back to uh, Israel, Egypt, excuse me, goes back to Egypt and tells the people, I've come in God's name to save you. It's going to be redemption. So you can imagine people were quite excited. And then Moshe, for the first time, goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And as many of you know, what happened was just the opposite. Pharaoh says, I don't recognize your God, and I'm not going to let the people go. And not only that, but... I'm going to make the work harder. You now have to gather your own straw to make bricks. 
So when Moshe comes out, he's greeted by uh, two individuals, Datan and Aviram, and they're like, you said you're coming to redeem us. You made things worse. So Moshe says to God, Why have you done evil to this people? And why have you sent me? From the time you sent me, not only did I not save them, but things got worse. And the last verse in, in, in last week's parsha, God says, now you'll see what I will do in taking Israel out of Egypt. And then that starts this parsha. And in this beginning of this parsha, God says, I did not appear to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov only by the name Kel Shakai. I did not appear as the name Yudke Vavke, which uh, God uh, revealed to Moshe at the burning bush. But all the commentaries notice that it says right in the text that this name Yudke Vavke did speak to the Avot, to the patriarchs. So Rashi explains a very, very important Rashi. He explains that this name, Yudke Vavke, in this context, he says, I appeared as Kel Shakai because I promised that I would give them Israel as an eternal inheritance for all of their uh, children forever. I promised, but I did not fulfill it yet. Now I'm going to fulfill it. Therefore, I'm revealing the name Yudke Bavke. I am faithful to fulfill my promises. So that's the connection between the two, the two parshas. We're going to get into more depths here. But it says in the Sefer Yitzira, it says, Na'ut sofan b'techilatan, the b'techilatan b'sofan. The end is in wedged in the beginning and the beginning in the end. Now this applies to many, many things. We want to apply it specifically to the cycle of exile and redemption. In Hebrew, the word for exile is gola and for, re for redemption is geula. The exact same letters except in redemption, there's an aleph. There's just a, an additional letter aleph. But what we learn from this is that the cycle of exile and redemption is intrinsically woven together. Just like we said, the end is embedded in the beginning and the beginning and the end. So redemption is embedded, engraved in exile. And until Mashiach comes, every redemption, there's embedded the next exile. Until we, in a sense, break that cycle in the Messianic era. So I want to narrow our focus on one idea here. And that is the phenomenon, the dynamic that in the Torah, in the whole Bible, and in our own lives, many times redemption or a positive change only comes when we get to the end. We're at the, we're at the end of our rope, when things couldn't, uh, in a sense, get worse. So I want to go through a number of, of examples in, in, in Jewish history, and we see this repeating itself over and over again. It's not just that redemption follows exile or light follows darkness, but there's this dynamic that, it, and it's not like all the time, but in so many cases, the new light, the new redemption, the new change, the new quantum leap can only happen when we get to the end. So right before God reveals himself to Moshe at the burning bush, the, the 
the verses before say, and Israel cried out from the burdens of slavery. Up to now, the Torah had not said that. Even though uh, we were enslaved for a total of around 80 years of the total time we were in, in Egypt. But 80 years to be slaves is, is, is not a short time. It's a long time. And here the Torah is finally recording that the people have gotten to the end. They're crying out. And the Torah says, and God heard their crying, and God knew. What does it mean that God knew? So when God told Avram at what's called Brita Batarim, the covenant of the pieces, that your children will be slaves, will be uh, strangers in a strange land for 400 years, four generations. And then God promised to take them out and return them to Israel. But in the Haggadah, so we say that God was chishev etakates. He contemplated the end. Now this word ketz in, in gematria, in Jewish numerology, equals 190. And so we learned that God took off 190 years from the first prophecy that the whole process of going down to Egypt and coming out would take 400 years. Why? Is because we cried, we got to the end. And so God realizing God is infinitely adaptable. And our prayers matter. We're told in the Talmud from the time that the temple was destroyed, the, in a sense, the gates of heaven have been closed. But it says, but for one thing, it's not closed, and that's tears. The gate of tears is never, never closed. So this is one example that the whole redemption from Egypt is, begins with our reaching the end and crying out. So we see this also when Yehuda, a few weeks ago, when Yehuda approaches Yosef, he's promised to bring Benjamin back to his father, Yaakov. And he, he promised that I'll, I'll lose my portion in the world to come if I don't, in this world and the world to come. Yehuda offers himself as uh, in, instead of Benjamin. He's at the end. And as soon as he does this, it says that Yosef could not hold back, and he revealed himself to his brothers. So again, it was only when Yehuda is pleading, not just with Yosef, but according to the commentaries, he's, he's pleading before God. Only then does Yosef reveal himself to his brothers. We see the same thing with Yaakov that at, he leaves Israel because his brother Asaph wants to kill him. And now he's coming back to Israel after 20 years, and he's going to meet him the next day because he's gotten reports that, that Asaph is on his way with 400 people. And that night, of course, is the famous, well-known uh, fight, rat, wrestling match, existential fight to the spiritual death between Yaakov and the man, the angel, and God himself. But again, Yaakov is, he's meeting Asa the next day, and even the Torah says he was afraid. So here also, he has this existential uh, battle with himself, with Asa, with the angel of Asa, and with God. He reaches the end, and what comes out of it is a new name, Yisrael. Kisarita imelokim ve'adam ve'anashim v'tuchal. Because you contended with God and man, and you prevailed. We just, not long ago, had the holiday of Hanukkah. And here again, we have, when the Greeks took over Israel, 
there was amiable relations. They were, they, they wanted taxes and they pretty much left everyone alone. Little by little, they began to oppress the Jews. And then with Antiochus, um, they defiled the temple and forbade uh, certain uh, mitzvot, important mitzvot. And again, Matatiahu and his sons felt this is the end. If we don't do something now, a majority of Jews had become more like Greeks than Jews. They had assimilated. And the, the whole rebellion was like a last effort. We're at the end here. If we don't do something now, Torah is not going to last. And then we have the, the, the holiday of Purim coming up. The same dynamic that Haman is about to uh, put into effect his threat to wipe out the Jewish people. He's well on his way to accomplishing that. And at the last pretty much minute, as Haman is coming to Ahasuerus to, to tell him to hang uh, Mordechai, he already has the permission to kill all the Jews. And at the last minute, everything gets turned around. So this idea is also, uh, I'm sure many of you who are, who are watching this, have experienced something like this in our own lives, where sometimes it could be professionally, it could be in a relationship, it could be in our trying to understand who we are and our relationship with the world, with God, with our own soul. And many times we get to, like, we're at the end. We, we, we don't know what to do, but we know that we can't carry on the way we've been carrying on. So this whole idea of exile and redemption is not just for the people of Israel and even the whole world, the, the first exile is when uh, Adam and Eve leave the Garden of Eden. That is the first exile. So all of humanity is in a state of, in a sense, exile until the final redemption. But in our own private lives, we can see this dynamic playing itself out. Now, the good thing is, if we recognize this, if we recognize it, sometimes uh, the expression is the darkest hour is just before the dawn. Everyone knows that expression, but it's true. We see that so many times that things have to get very dark. The probably the, I wouldn't say the best example, but the most dramatic example is the Holocaust and the, the rebirth of the state of Israel. That the Holocaust was pretty much as a desperate situation as the Jewish people have ever faced. And yet, in a, a mystery that we, we, we really don't understand quite yet, but we do see the results that just three years after the Holocaust, the state of Israel was, was reborn. And here we are approximately 75 years later, and we are, we're, still, we're still surrounded by enemies, et cetera. But Israel is a thriving, dynamic, growing place. It's like, really, especially technologically, it's one of the, the powers of the world right now. Everyone knows it. The, the, all of these recent peace agreements, there are many, many reasons behind it, but one is that why shouldn't we make peace with the Jews? Like, like they have a good thing going. Why, why are we fighting them? Okay, there's other factors, but that, that's an important factor as well. So now I want to go back to what Moshe says to God. He says, why have you done evil to this people? 
why did you send me? It's worse now than ever. So there's a major question then, if we go back to the burning bush, so we see that God said clearly to him that God, Pharaoh will not listen to you in the beginning. And there will have to be a series of, of plagues or calamities until he will listen to you. And in the end, he will listen and you will go free. So it's not like Moshe didn't understand the game plan here. It, 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 it's hard to say that when he went into Pharaoh the first time and said, let my people go, that there was an expectation. He was like, okay, okay, when do you want to leave? How can we help you? God had already explained what the process would be. So the question is, why is Moshe going back to God and saying, why have you done evil to this people? So one of the answers is, that Moshe's question is not over the tactics here, but Moshe, once he took on the mantle of leadership, his compassion for the Jewish people had no bounds. That's why in the desert, over and over again, he defends Israel before God. He even says, if you don't have compassion on them, wipe me out of your book. So here we see that this, this is truly what God wanted from Moshe. But Moshe's question was much more existential. What he was saying to God is, God, I understand the cycle of exile and redemption. I understand that light can only come after darkness. I understand that this world, which is in Kabbalah called the world of rectification, can only come before previous worlds had shattered. And, and the shattered vessels of previous worlds make up the components of this world. I understand all of that, but my question is, or my complaint is, God, you could make it any way you want. I understand the, the wisdom behind this dynamic that you have set up from, the, from my personal life to the nation of Israel to the whole world. <clears throat> but you're God. You can make it any way you want. Can't you do it in a way that there's not so much suffering? And the truth is, this is the deepest question in the world that we really don't have the answer for. We don't have the answer why a God who can make it any way he wants has decided to make the world the way it is now. We do have answers, and they're important answers, and they do work. That to be an image of God, we have to have free choice. This is this is one of the most godly aspects, one of the greatest gifts that God gives us is that we have free choice. We're considered higher than the angels. The angels don't have free choice. They're on a very, very high level. They do God's will. But they don't really have a choice about it. We have a choice. And therefore, we can make all kinds of wrong decisions and go really off the path and even over the over the cliff but this is the <clears throat> this is the gift the responsibility and the the uh, call it the problem of free will but god wants us to earn being an image of god and for those who were watching last week we discussed this it was called going down in order to rise up. That's why the soul, which is coming from a very high, pristine, holy place, comes down to this world at all, is because there's something precious that we can accomplish in this world that we couldn't accomplish had we not come. And so... <clears throat> Moshe asks this question, and 
you know, it's like it's like using the computer. It's the computer. The whole world is based in computers, but there are certain rules to how a computer works and what you can do. We could say, why can't it be different? Why can't I do this and not that, or this in an easier way? And maybe in 10 years or 20 years, they'll come up with a new, <laughs> they seem every, every other day to come up with new technology. But right now we have to play by the rules. You have to play by the rules. If, if, if the, if the uh, speed limit is 60 miles an hour and you're going 90 and a policeman stops you and you say, well, the government can make it any way they want. Why isn't it 100 miles an hour? It won't get you very far. You're going to have to probably pay <laughs> that, uh, that ticket. There's certain rules also in, 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 in the laws of nature. We could ask, why does certain laws of nature work the way they do? Why does entropy work the way it does? Well, that's how God set it up. So this is where prayer comes in, faith comes in, trust comes in, and what's called hishtadlut, making our effort. Because as we saw, God contemplated the end. When he saw that the Jewish people were at the end, or according to Jewish tradition, we had reached the 49th level of impurity. And God saw that if we fell even one more level, in a sense, we would be unredeemable. Now, obviously, God can do anything and could redeem us even from the 50th level of impurity. But as, as, as a metaphor, God saw we couldn't handle any more. And so therefore, <clears throat> he brought us up. But that was our hishtadlut, because we cried out. And so the teaching, the Hasidic teaching is that <clears throat> if a person is in a bad situation, Again, it could be a relationship, it could be in a job, it could be in a community, it, all kinds of things. As long as we can deal with it and we rather not rock the boat and status quo is better than the fear of change, we'll just stay in whatever the situation is. It's only when we get to the places I this can't go on. This is not positive. This is not uh, healthy. There has to be a change here. That, and that's when it happens. And so Rabbi Nachman tells us two wonderful things. Ein yeyush ba'olam. There is no such thing as giving up in this world. Because sometimes when we get to the end, that's our natural inclination is I give up. I throw my hands up. I can't, I can't, I can't deal with it anymore. And Rabbi Nachman also said, everyone knows, Kala Olam Kulo Gesher Tsar Ma'od, Ba'ikar Lo Litpached Klal. This whole world is a very narrow bridge, but the most important thing is not to be afraid. If these are the, the rules of the game then I will engage with them and I'm going to do the best I can. And I'm even going to do it. Another teaching from Rabbi Nachman is Pesimcha. I'm going to, I'm going to face the obstacles and challenges in life with, with joy. But what's so important is what's called Hishtad Lut. That when we get to the end, we have to make that effort to make the change. We have to, in a sense, take the bulls by the horn, and we have to like, okay, if this is not healthy, and this is not positive, and this can't continue like this, then we have to take the action to change it. And one of those actions is prayer. One of those actions is having faith and turning to Hashem and turning to our own inner neshama 
and pouring out our heart and expressing to the master of the world what, what we like to see happen and what we're willing to, to do about it. And so we're told that this is the, the weapon of Mashiach, as we're told, is through prayer. And again, prayer can be passive. We can think of prayer as being very passive, but it's also very active. It can change us dramatically, and it can change, as it were, God's way that he deals with us, and it can change the whole world. So I want to end with a blessing and just bless us that, first of all, that we don't have to get to the end in order to, to make the changes that we need to do. But if we do feel we're at the end, that we have in our back pocket the, the, the wisdom to know that this is the time for prayer, this is the time for action, this is the time for change, and have the confidence and the, and the, and the trust that God will help me through this. So I want to bless everyone that, that we can accomplish all that we want to accomplish. Okay, so just give me a 